Hello everyone and welcome to a Horribly Nerdy Podcast, the podcast that's so bad, horrible, as in its name. And on this podcast, we talk about everything from video games to comic books to the paranormal and much more. So we're going to be continuing our Women in History Month with some women that made a huge impact and what I what I believe made a huge impact in the comic book industry, uh, some horror authors, so some literature horror, and we're going to talk about an actress that I believe is one of the best screen queens around, and I feel even though, yes, she's kind of loved in the horror genre, but even in the mainstream, she needs to be talked about much more. Let's talk Anne Radcliffe. Born July 9th, 1764, passed away February 7th, 1823. Anne was an English author and a pioneer of Gothic fiction. Her technique of explaining apparently supernatural elements in her novels has been credited with gaining Gothic fiction respectability. Her technique of explaining apparently supernatural elements in her novels has been credited with gaining gothic fiction respectability. I can't say that word. Her technique of explaining apparently supernatural elements in her novels has been credited with gaining gothic fiction respectability in the 1790s. Radcliffe was the most popular writer of her day and almost universally admired. Contemporary critics called her the mighty enchantress and the Shakespeare of romance writers, and her popularity continued through the 19th century. Interest has also revived in the early of 21st century with the publication of three biographies. She was born Anne Ward in Holborn. Her father was William Ward, a haberdasher who moved the family to Bath to manage a china shop in 1772. Her mother was Anne Oates of Chesterfield. Radcliffe occasionally lived in Chelsea with her maternal uncle, Thomas Bentley, who was in partnership with a fellow Unitarian, Josiah Wedgwood, maker of the Wedgwood China. Uh, Suki, Wedgwood's daughter, also stayed in Chelsea and is Radcliffe's only known childhood companion. Suki later married Dr. Robert Darwin and had a son, the naturalist Charles Darwin. Although mixing in some distinguished circles, Radcliffe seems to have made little impression in this society and was described by Wedgwood as Bentley's shy niece. In 1787, Ward married the Oxford graduate and journalist William Radcliffe, part owner and editor of the English Chronicle. He often came home late and to occupy her time she began to write and to read her work to him when he returned. Theirs was a childless and seemingly happy marriage. Radcliffe called him her nearest relative and friend. The money she earned from her novels later allowed them to travel together along with their dog, Chance. In her final years, Radcliffe retreated from In her final years, Radcliffe retreated from public life and was rumored to have become insane as a result of her writing. These rumors arose because Radcliffe just stopped writing after publishing her five novels, though the last three were very successful. She remained secluded for 26 years with no real explanation available to her many fans. Anne died on February 7, 1823, and was buried in a vault in the Chapel of of Ease at St. George's Hanover Square in London. Although she had suffered from asthma for 12 years previously, her modern biographer Richter Norton cites the description given by her physician, Dr. Scudamore, of a of how a new inflammation seized the membranes of the brain which led to violent symptoms and argues that they suggest a bronchial infection leading to pneumonia high fever delirium and death there are few artifacts or manuscripts that give insight into radcliffe's personal life but in 2014 a rare letter from radcliffe to her mother-in-law was found in the archive at the british library its tone suggests a strained relationship between the two which may have inspired the relationship between elena rosabella and the marchesa di vivaldi in her novel the italian Little is known of Anne Radcliffe's life. In 1823, the year of her death, the Edinburgh Review said she never appeared in public nor mingled in private society, but kept herself apart. 
like the sweet bird that sings its solitary notes, shrouded and unseen. Shortly after her death, Gaston de Blanville was published for Henry Colburn, featuring a memoir for the authoress, the first known biographical piece on Radcliffe. Christina Rossetti attempted to write a biography of Radcliffe in 1883, but abandoned it for lack of information. For 50 years, biographers stayed away from her as a subject, agreeing with Rossetti's estimation. Richter Norton, author of Mistress of Udolpho, The Life of Anne Radcliffe, argues those 50 years were denominated by interpretation rather than scholarship, where information specifically on her rumored madness was repeated rather than traced to a reliable source. According to Ruth Fazer, physically, she said she was to be exquisitely proportioned, quite short, complexion beautiful, as was her whole countenance, especially her eyes, eyebrows, and mouth. So, let's move on to her books, her many wonderful, fantastic books. We have The Caffles of Afflin and Dunbane, the first volume, 1789, a Sicilian romance, two volumes in 1790, The Romance of the Forest, three volumes in 1791, The Mysteries of Adolfo, The Mysteries of Udolfo, four volumes in 1794, a journey made in the summer of 1974 that was uh, printed in 1795, there was only one volume, The Italian, three volumes in 1797, and Gaston de Blanville in 1826. She is most famously known for her novel, The Italian, or The Confessional of the Black Penitence. It's a gothic novel. It's the last book Radcliffe published during her lifetime. It has a dark mysterious and somber tone which fixates on the themes of love, devotion, and persecution during time period of Holy Inquisition. The novel novel deals with issues prevalent at the time of the French Revolution, such as religion and nationality. Radcliffe's renowned use of veiled imagery is considered to have reached a site of sophistication and complexity in the Italian. Concealment and disguise are central motifs of the novel. In line with late 18th century sensibility and its parallel fetishization of the sublime and the sentimentally pastoral. The heightened emotional states of Radcliffe's characters are often reflected through the pathetic fallacy. The novel is noted for its extreme effective antagonist, Father Shadani, who influenced the Byronic characters of Victorian literature. The Romance of the Forest Another gothic novel, first published in 1791, it combines an air of mystery and suspense with an examination of the tension between hedonism and morality. The novel was her first major popular success, going through four editions in its first three years. Furthermore, this novel also established her reputation as the first among her era's writers of romance. There is surprisingly little essential difference in characterization, gothic decor, or plot outline to distinguish this novel from its predecessors. Its superior merit lies in the expansive and subtle use which the author makes of these elements so that the characters are relatively well realized. The the gothic decor is blended into the sensibility of the reader rather than imposed upon, and the plot is an intricate and often dramatic series of congruent incidents and living tableau, not a conjuries of barely related and stillborn seeds and surprises. Most critics who have given any attention to Radcliffe as a novelist have decided that she is importantly chiefly for her use of the supernatural and for her emphasis upon landscape. Uh, Anne is pretty much responsible for the boom in gothic romance novels, so things like vampires, uh, falling in love with spirits, uh anything that could be said by poe things like that the whole gothic influence pretty much she started it fantastic fantastic writer i highly recommend you find radcliffe's novels read them they're fantastic they're wordy but they're great especially if you are into gothic romance you will love these books highly highly recommended. 
let's talk one of the famous Scream Queens and one of my first horror crushes, Barbara Crampton. Born December 27th, 1958, she is an American actress and producer. She began her career in the 1980s in television soap operas before starring in horror and thriller films. Both paths would, would define her continued accolade winning career. Crampton made her television debut on daytime drama Days of Our Lives before a supporting role as Liana Love on the soap opera The Young and the Restless. Uh, she was on Days of Our Lives for a year, 1983 to 1984. Uh, later in her career, she would appear in television horror anthologies such as Sci-Fi's Channel Zero, The Dream Door, Hulu's Into the Dark, and Shudder's Creep Show. And she does fantastic in every single one of those. She made her film debut in Body Double, but received recognition in the comedy horror film Reanimator as Megan Halsley and the science fiction film From Beyond as Dr. Catherine McMichaels, later defining roles as rating uh, later defining roles in Chopping Mall, The Original Puppet Master, Castle Freak, Your Next, We Are Still Here, A Little Sister. Puppet Master The Little Strike and Jacob's Wife. In 2021, she did a voice role for the first person shooter video game, Back for Blood. She was born in Levittown, Long Island, New York, raised Catholic. She grew up in Vermont and spent summers traveling the country with the carnival as her father was a carny. She started acting in school plays when she was in seventh grade and went on to studying acting in high school. She attended Castleson State College in Vermont graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Theater Arts. After graduation, Crampton made a brief stop in New York, where she appeared as Cordelia in King Lear for the American Theater of Actors. She was a Theater Arts major at Castleton State College from 1976 to 1981. From New York, Crampton moved to Los Angeles, where she made her television debut on the daytime drama Days of Our Lives, where she played Trista Evans Bradford and subsequently starred in the pilot episode of Rituals, the television film Love Thy Neighbor, and the television series Santa Barbara. She made her film debut in the 1984 film Body Double. The following year, Crampton portrayed Chrissy in Fraternity Vacation, Megan Halsey in Reanimator, and Stacy in Hotel. In 1986, Crampton portrayed Susie Lynn in Chopping Mall, Dr. Catherine McMichaels in From Beyond, and Anne White in Prince of Bel-Air. In 1987, Crampton was cast in Kidnapped and portrayed Terry in O'Hara. From 1987 to 2007, Crampton portrayed Liana Love in The Young and the Restless. In 1989, Camp Crampton had a cameo role in the horror film Puppet Master and portrayed Sadie Brady in Trancers 2 in 1991. In 93, Crampton portrayed archaeologist Dr. Lita Fanning in Robot Wars with Don Michael Paul. You're going to notice there's kind of a, a theme here. She did a lot of work with Full Moon Pictures, and that's great. Full Moon Pictures is fantastic. They've done some really good stuff. She signed a contract. I'm, I'm sure she signed a contract with them and did a lot of films with them. And you're going to hear a lot more. Uh, she also guest starred on Civil Wars and portrayed Mindy Lewis on Guiding Light from 1993 to 1995. She left when her contract expired and got engaged to LA based director and actor Christopher Tabori in April of 1995. Unfortunately, by September of the same year, their engagement was called off. In 95, Crampton starred in Cast Freak. With Jeffrey Combs. From 1995 to 98, Camp Crampton portrayed Maggie Forrester in The Bold and the Beautiful. In 96, Crampton portrayed in 96, Crampton portrayed Carol in Space Truckers. In 1997, she guest starred on The Nanny. The following year, she guest starred on Party of Five and starred in the film The Godson. She also would continue to guest star in series like Pacific Blue. In 2001, Crampton had a recurring role as Dr. Leslie Bogan in five episodes of the television series Spider Games and starred in Thy Neighbor's Wife. In 2004, Crampton starred in The Sisterhood. She subsequently starred in Read You Like a Book and Never Enough. She was also a special guest of Creation Entertainment's Weekend of Horror in 2010. 
She had a supporting role in the 2011 horror slasher film, which kind of led to a resurgence of her career, in my opinion. Like, she had been doing bit parts here and there, but I feel like after she had kind of come out and did your next, she was saying like, hey, I'm back, let's do this. Uh, she played the leading role in Sacchetti in We Are Still Here, which is another great horror film. Uh, Crampton next appeared in Road Games, in which she spoke, in which she speaks both French and English. And then in 2015, she starred along an ensemble cast like Robert England, Danny Trejo, Kane Hodder, Bill Mosley, Michael Berryman, Doug Bradley, Gunnar Hansen, Ken Ferrey, and Dee Wallace in the Harrison Smith horror film Death House, which is said to be the expendables of the horror film. Uh, in 2018, Crampton was given the prestigious Horror Channel Lifetime Achievement Award at Grimfest in Manchester, United Kingdom. And in 2021, Crampton produced and starred in the horror drama Jacob's Wife, which she personally developed over the course of several years. That same year, she voiced serial killer Nicola Astor in an audio drama adaptation of Our Lady Inferno and appeared in the Lovecraftian film Sacrifice. She also went on to produce a remake and reimagining of the original Castle Freak. Okay, let's talk about this remake of Castle Freak. Um, I wasn't a gigantic fan of the original. It was not what I was expecting. Um, it's not that it's not a good movie. It is a good movie. Uh, it's definitely different from what I was expecting. And then they did this reimagining of Castle Freak, which is very interesting because what I like is, yes, uh, the original Castle Freak is very loosely based on a uh, Lovecraftian tale, where the remake really goes into more Lovecraftian territory and is kind of setting up its own Lovecraft universe, which I really enjoyed, even though uh, it's kind of a really, really strange film. But I enjoyed the uh, remake of Castle Freak more than the original, in my own opinion. But I'm probably one of the few out there that believes that. But uh, I, I do think the original Castle Freak is a good film. I think Jeffrey Combs and Jeffrey Combs and Barbara Crampton do a fantastic job in that film. It just wasn't my cup of tea. Uh, Barbara Crampton kind of paved the way for females in horror. And I say that because she was one of the very few women that wasn't afraid to go topless. Which, in that day and age, that was something, unfortunately, was kind of expected of you as a woman in horror. Uh, her and Liana Quigley, who we'll be talking about very soon, had no problem being those two that would immediately, okay, let's take our clothes off whatever. It's film. I'm working. I don't care. Uh, I've seen a few interviews where she addresses this and eventually she finally got some notoriety to the point to where she didn't need to do that anymore. When they said, oh, we want a topless scene, she'd say, nope, I'm either in this film or I'm not. And they were like, okay, fine. No need. We can get someone else to do it. And she has cemented her place in horror history as one of the original scream queens, in my opinion. Barbara Crampton, fantastic actress, can't get enough of her, highly recommend to search out all of her films, they're all enjoyable, she does a great job, check her out. Let's talk influential women in comic book history. Let's talk Elizabeth Holloway Marston. Though Dr. William Moulton Marston is credited with Wonder Woman's creation, it was his wife Elizabeth who advised him on many aspects of the characters concept. Elizabeth was a highly educated woman who held advanced degrees in psychology and law, meeting Marston in law school and later marrying him after helping with his research, resulting in the systolic blood pressure test, which was subsequently, which was subsequently incorporated into the polygraph. 
when Marston was hired by the publishing companies that later became DC Comics as an educational consultant, he had the idea of a hero who fought with love and not violence. Elizabeth suggested that it be a woman, and along with Olive Byrne, Marston's former student and part of the couple's polyamorous relationship, was used to design Wonder Woman's concept. You notice that's a polyamorous relationship, especially back in the early, uh, I believe it was the early 50s and 60s. Not something that was very common back then. Flo Steinberg. Nicknamed the... Flo Steinberg, who in... Flo Steinberg, who earned the nickname Fabulous Flo, began as the secretary and fan liaison as Marvel Comics began publishing comics in the 1960s. Steinberg was responsible for coordinating and making sure that artists meet deadlines, responding to fan letters, and making sure the artwork was delivered to the Comics Code Authority for approval and adherence to the Comics Code. During her tenure at Marvel, Steinberg became enthralled with the underground comic scene. After leaving Marvel in 1968, she created and published independent comic books in 1975, Big Apple Comics, with it becoming one of the first major independent underground comics. And the October 1978 issue of What If No. 11, Steinberg appeared as the Invisible Woman, starred alongside Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, and Saul Brodsky, who completed the imaginary Fantastic Four. Ramona Fradden began her career in comics in 1950, at a time when it was unusual for women to work on, let alone illustrate comic books or comic strips. After graduating from Parsons School of Design, Fradden landed her first assignment at DC Comics, a Shining Knight feature, before moving on to her first ongoing assignment, illustrating Aquaman as part of the Adventure Comics backup feature. Throughout her years with DC Comics, she created characters such as Aqualad, co-creating Metamorpho, and handling art duties on Plastic Man, Freedom Fire, and Super Friends. In 1980, she became the artist for the comic strip Brenda Starr until 1995, and was later inducted into the Comic Book Hall of Fame in 2006. Anne Nocenti has undertaken many roles in the comic book industry since starting her career at Marvel Comics in 1982. Nocenti, known for her outspoken political view focusing on the position of women in society and the role of government, wrote her first work for the Marvel anthology in Bizarre Adventures No. 32, which led to her first regular comics assignment, Spider-Woman. Nocenti would... Nocenti would go on to write Daredevil edit titles such as New Mutants and The Uncanny X-Men, and creating characters such as Typhoid Mary, Longshot, Mojo, and Spyro. Nocenti has also worked for DC Comics writing Green Arrow, Catwoman, and Katana during the New 52 era, and did an entire 16-issue Kid Eternity series for Vertigo in the 1990s. Louise Simonson Louise Weezy Simonson is a comic writer and editor best known for her work for Marvel and DC Comics. She began her professional comic book career with Warren Publishing, where she became the senior editor of titles such as Creepy, Eerie, and Vampirella. Three of my absolute favorite titles. Sorry, just had to add that in because Creepy, Eerie, and Vampirella are amazing, amazing books. Vampirella being super hard to find, super expensive, along with Creepy and Eerie. Uh, before leaving the company at the end of 1979 to work for Marvel Comics editing, uh, uh, before leaving the company at the end of 1979 to work for Marvel Comics editing, Uncanny X-Men and the New Mutants. In 1983, she would begin writing for Marvel, creating the Power Pack and X-Men such as Cable and Apocalypse. She would later make a move to DC Comics, launching the Superman: The Man of Steel title and chief architect of the Death of Superman storyline and creating John Henry, a.k.a. Steel. She continues to work with various publishing companies, as well as continuing to do projects for Marvel and DC. And we're going to... This list is about 10 people long. We're going to wrap it up there. We'll get back to the next five next week. But I wanted to give kind of a little teaser on some very influential women in comic books. Um, you know, I didn't really go in-depth as their history and life because, well... It's, it would just be too long of an episode. I think I'm going to pick a few of those women 
and kind of more focus on their lives in the future. But for now, I just kind of wanted to give a rundown on the impact that, you know, some, especially some fantastic women have made in the comic book genre. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode of a Horribly Nerdy Podcast. I hope you enjoy it. We have much more to talk about next week. Uh, we're going to focus a little more on uh, some horror actresses and filmmakers. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit more on women and video games and some more women authors. Uh, ones that I'm particularly big fans of. So, again, thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you next week.